I'm Liz Bernier with HRPA, and this is HR Today. Today we have John Boudreau, who just delivered a keynote session called Lead the Work. Can you tell us a bit about your session? Sure, it was a pleasure, first of all, to be here. Uh, and the title Lead the Work really refers to the idea of leadership being about leading the work, not just the employees. And the idea that work may come from lots of different sources, and in many cases it won't be done by regular employees. So it's kind of a question, are you leading if you stop at your employees, or do you need to be leading in a way that lots of workers all over the world are eager to work with you? So you've done a lot of thought and discussion about the changing nature of employment and the changing definition of what is an employee. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, I think uh, there's, there's uh, within the employment relationship there are lots of changes. Some companies, for example, are offering uh, like um, talent marketplaces to their people where they have a set of tasks that need to be done and they solicit volunteers. So even within employment, you start to see these changes where work is becoming more deconstructed and the projects or the pieces of it are available for people to work on. And then, of course, there's all the changes that happen when you think perhaps certain work doesn't need to be done by an employee, but could be a contractor, a volunteer, a gamer, a partner, something like that. So we've already seen these models shifting and freelancers and contract mm -hmm. workers and untraditional employees being brought on board, but there aren't a lot of laws, there's not a lot of legislation around what that looks like, how they're treated, benefits, etc. How do you anticipate that might shift in the future? I think it's actually a real opportunity for the HR profession. Okay. So, so I, think it, I think it will need to shift in the future and I think you've characterized it very well. Right now, understandably, laws, legislation, regulations tend to think of work as embedded within a job, which is embedded within an organization. And the protections, and certainly in the United States, many of the safety nets, benefits, pensions, etc., are very much connected to being employed by an employer. Uh, as we have more of the work being done by people who aren't regular employees, um, I think there's going to need to be a shift in our thinking, thinking more about good work and not just about good jobs, and good work could mean that we have a portable pension system, we have a portable uh, uh, insurance system. Uh, so, so, you know, the, the medical care is a good example. Many people are wondering, now that it's possible they're changing the U.S. Obamacare system, will I be able to keep my medical benefits mm -hmm. even if I'm not employed by someone? Uh, one of the most interesting ones is the language of work. So you've got capabilities, I've got capabilities. We, we present them in a certain way, maybe in a resume or on LinkedIn. Um, others might be looking around for workers, let's say, or, or capabilities. Mm -hmm. Their language may not match ours. Okay. So, so you might be a perfect match for a position in media relations or something like that, but their job description looks different from what you've done. So a very interesting uh, issue for, I think, states and, and regulators is should we have a generalizable language so that your capabilities are translatable by someone who looks at you on the web or on a platform? Okay, that is interesting. Is there anything you would recommend um, on the employer level as a best practice for, for handling this? Is there anything you've seen or researched that seems to work well? I think it really varies and, and I think it the, the, probably the best thing you can recommend is to look at your own situation. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things that we talk about in the book. Um, I encourage HR leaders and leaders to look at the, the work of their organization and right now it's encapsulated in jobs. And some of that work is going to be perfectly good done in traditional ways by traditional workers. So you should put that over here and don't worry yourself with trying to change it. But there's going to be pockets of your organization where you'll realize that certain options might be available. Maybe you're already contracting, etc. So in the book we talk about deconstructing the work, so take it apart and look at its pieces. Mm -hmm. For example, a software uh, project leader often does coding. Okay. The coding part might be done on a platform. Mm. The project leadership part might stay. So deconstruct the work, then think about your organization boundary. Ask yourself, is the best talent in the world maybe a, a member of a partner organization? So if you, if you need to develop uh, applications for the phone, for, for example, Visa, the credit card company, mm. wanted to develop a phone that was a credit card. Oh. So they collaborated with Apple. They brought Apple engineers into Visa, Visa payment engineers, put them in a room together, protected the IP, 
and said, figure out how to make the phone a credit card. Okay. So that's an example of Visa saying, okay, the best talent in the world exists at Apple. Could we tap into them mm -hmm. rather than competing with them for talent? So that's another way is think about your existing partnerships, your existing projects. How might our boundary, if we could loosen it up a little bit, if we could permeate it a bit, where might we find talent? And then the final one we talk about is rewards. Um, could you get more creative? In the world of um, boundaryless talent, the reward is often um, the credit for being the best, like in gaming communities or, or in, the, in the coding community, being the best a computer coder, you get a reputation for that, being the best web maker. So are we beginning to think about rewards like reputation, rewards like um, uh, glory or credit, Mm -hmm. um, rewards like a sense of purpose. Many of these projects attracted workers because they, they were attracted to the world-changing element. I've got a favorite example of video gamers or gamers that got involved in a project to help solve the AIDS virus. Wow. And it was a mathematics problem. It okay. involved folding the cure in a way that it would fit into the virus. And these were mathematicians. They were already playing a game about mathematical folding, mm -hmm. and someone was smart enough to say, you can help us solve the AIDS problem if wow. you'll work on this problem. Okay, some really amazing ideas and interesting food for thought. Thanks, thanks. so much for joining us. Thanks, Liz. Pleasure. I'm Liz Bernier. This is HR Today. This has been John Boudreau, and thanks for joining us.